Thank you. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys. First of all, let me start by saying thanks. And uh, I haven't been to sleep, so I've just come off a flight. And um, so this might be a bit of a therapy session, at least for me. <laughs> it will definitely be a therapy session for me. And I hope it will be a therapy session for you guys as well, because take this the right way. I'm really happy to be here at Penguin, but I don't really give a fuck about Penguin. And I don't give a fuck about Vice. What I honestly give a fuck about is you individually. Because for whatever reason, I've been kind of sent to this earth in this particular rotation. I've ended up kind of working with people, usually one-on-one, -on -one, usually CEOs. I had the crazy experience of having to work with a lot of celebrities. So like, you know, trying to explain the internet to Bjork in 2004, when she was like sitting there smoking a joint. She said, yes, the internet is like a tree. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and you kind of, you know, so basically what you start to realize is that, and this is kind of one of my contentions here, is that innovation isn't really this big thing that happens up here that people are like, innovation, fast company, magazine, da da da. It's more intimate, it's more introspective. And so, as a kind of actual introvert that pretends to be an extrovert, I think this is kind of, you're going to see some of that. So, one of the things that we think about a lot when we think of innovation is I think about like, just like, like so that kind of thing you see on Instagram, which is like a sunset with some words of sage advice, like, innovation is really good, you know? And this is kind of the general level of the innovation conversation. It's all about inspiration. So, you know, and sometimes, you know, people are like, how deeply inspirational? And like, I give talks a lot, and people will say, it's really, really inspiring. And I'm gonna be totally honest with you, please don't fucking tell me that you were really, really inspired by this, <laughs> okay? And I just wanna say, this is my first GIF. Um, I've never made a GIF before, but I'm really proud of it. If you want to see it just one more time, you can see it. Yeah, there. <laughs> but so I had the very crazy experience a long, long time ago. Um, I went to university, and like every single person from Essex, as you can maybe tell, I wanted to be a DJ. So if you have a heart attack in Essex, you'll probably die because there's no doctors or anything. There's just DJs and uh, yoga teachers. Um, and so basically, um, I, I started a you know a thing where I wanted to have people come to uh, the student union because, you know, my friends in other universities, like Leeds, as we were just chatting about that, they had big bands and big awesome DJs coming to their unions. And we had like, you know, basically DJ Dan, who was this one guy, you know. And so I was like, why doesn't that happen? So I started trying to book these big DJs. And I, I went to Fabric and said, would you, everyone, you just went like this, oh no, not Fabric. <laughs> but people literally like, have like a kind of like wince when you say Fabric. But I said, you know, would you be interested in doing a student night? And they said, well, if you can book talent that we never book, you know, big, big names, you can have the club for free. I was like, brilliant, this is amazing. So I made this list, you know, it was like Michael Jackson, you know, Prince. Like, in fact, everyone on that list is now dead. <laughs> um, but what I kind of realized was that um, I didn't have any money. So what I started to do, Martin, my brother, who's actually here today, he was smarter than me, to be fair. And you know, we had this thing where, he <laughs> still am, yeah. And we had this thing where we didn't really have a girlfriend or uh, shared or any or individually. And, uh, and not that many friends, I think it's fair to say either, right? And, and, but one thing that you tend to find with people who have not that many friends and no girlfriend is they're very, very good at digital. <laughs> so um, we were very, very good at digital. And so what we turned around to, to um, the, celeb the, you know, the talent and said was, look, we don't have any money, but we'll do your digital instead. Right? So this kind of started this journey. So weirdly, this was one of our clients um, before she went insane. Um, uh, so Buckingham Palace was, was a client of ours at one point. You know, we had um, clients that you'll see in a second, some big, big, big name people that you would know. So look, over to you. New year, new you. How's it going? How are those... Resolutions. Why is everyone looking down? <laughs> Everyone's like laughing, like, oh, yes, I remember I decided that. Is anyone finding it? Is anyone keeping their resolutions? Ah, oh, good, good answer. Um, so look, resolutions feel like a very far away from, from innovation, but I kind of want to show you that they're not really that far away. Um, we are actually, I think it's, there's two official days of Quitters Day. One is the 12th of January and one is the 5th of February. I, I'm going with this one. Today is literally Happy Quitters Day. This is the day when you go, oh, oh no, fuck me. I'm turning back into the person I was last year. 
right? Like, this is when you're like, I became someone new for a month, and then you're like, no! You wake up and you've been possessed by the ghost of yourself, right? And so, uh, one of the things in innovation is that we say that the two biggest flaws of innovation are, number one, the wrong goal. You set yourself the actual wrong goal. And this is, so I want you to see this in, in, in the intimate, but also in the, in the kind of, in the extremist, right? So, individually, we do the same thing as we do as companies. So, like, not being funny, but like Penguin, Vice, whoever, we often just set the wrong goal. It was never the right goal to begin with. And then we have no method for locking that goal in. And so that's why, in exactly the same way as it's very, very difficult to keep our resolutions, it's even more, in fact, exponentially more difficult to keep our innovation goals. So, this kind of system of lock-in is this idea that actually, you know, my brother and I kind of developed basically over a certain amount of time with help from some very interesting individuals that we met along the way, and you know, some celebrities, some CEOs, etc. That. So the whole idea is that lock-in is, is designed to overcome setting the wrong goal and not having a method to lock it in. So, wrong goals. I told you, inspiration. Now, I cannot even tell you the amount of times that I've gone into meetings with people and explained, honestly, the actual answer to everything that they need to do. And I'm not like being, this is not me being a genius, it's just that I've had no friends for so long that I've made all decisions you could make and all mistakes you could make in digital. So they say that like an expert is someone who just made every single bad decision in a very specific area, right? And so when, I, when they send me in to, to meet these people, I say, look, I promise you, just listen to this and then it will work. And I remember, you know, as I mentioned, you know, when I had, the, I had a company, it was bought by William Morris Endeavor, which is a big talent agency, as you probably know, so you have to deal with them. Um, and, you know, one of the first things they said was, right, you're the chief digital officer of William Morris Endeavor, go and meet Madonna. So I'm like, right, okay, go in there and meet Madonna. I'm like, okay, Madonna, this is how the digital thing happens, and the da da da. And you know what she said? It's really inspirational. <laughs> and when people use that word, I know. Oh God, it's been a complete waste of time. However, I explained a couple of months later the exact same idea to Lady Gaga and her team, and she was like, I don't get it, but let's, so it's a bit unfair, but like <laughs> something along those lines. I don't really get it, but let's do it, right? So it just shows you, and look, you, oh my God. Beautiful piece of music by Brian Eno, but it's uh, my mum calling, so probably not a good time. <laughs> Not a good time right now, mum, but beautiful tune. It's called Ascent and Ending. Um, <laughs> that's a really calming ringtone. <laughs> um, so, you know, with, with, with Gaga, we were like, look, you know, this is how you do it. Right? And I'll explain to you exactly what it is now. And literally, this is exactly it. And you'll never need to learn anything else about digital for now, anyway. And basically, she completely took Madonna's place in culture, right? So this is disruption. This is how people come out of nowhere and usurp a mega brand that has created and led culture for decades, right? And it's terrifying, to be honest with you. Um, now, innovation. This is what most people want to talk about when I come in and talk about innovation. They're like, ah, and uh, the Snapchat is good, isn't it? And the Facebook. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, and look, I, I, <laughs> I went to see Martin's, Martin's got a kid, and it's my, my nephew, and uh, went to go and see him play football the other day, and we're there, and maybe perhaps a little hungover, and I just saw, if you've ever seen five-year-olds play football, the ball goes over here, every single five-year-old will chase the ball, right? Like, every single one, and their parents as well, and they'll basically, like, kick each other, and there's a big, like, it's just, everyone falls on the floor, and they're crying, and then the ball will eventually kind of scuttle out and go the other side, and every single five-year-old will then follow the ball again, right? And it's exhausting. I remember I just turned to Martin and said, this is exhausting, like spiritually exhausting. And then it hit me, this is what innovation's like. Because what people think innovation is, is they're like 360 video, uh, influencers. Um, you know, then it'd be like, no, she's not hot anymore, new influencer, right? And then it'll be like uh, Facebook carousel, Snapchat filters, you know, and it's just never ending, right? And if you go back to like all good DJs from Essex at this time, you know, we thought that the answer to becoming a DJ was the mini disc, right? And when you look back with a critical eye, you know, and I don't mean critical as in cynical, I mean critical, like using, using that critical function that you have, you realize that, you know, anyone playing with Pokemon Go recently? Nope. 
Because in my day, if you wanted to run around looking at things that weren't there, trying to collect them, you had to just do acid, right? But Pokemon Go lets the Generation Z do this themselves. You know, segways, now I'm sure they're probably big in LA, right? But everywhere else, segways don't really happen, right? Um, Bitcoin, if you did the mistake that I made of investing quite a lot of your personal wealth into Bitcoin, you will know that that has died, right? And VR, which uh, I've been in innovation 11 years, for 11 years it's been the year of VR. Right? I can't even tell you, like, 2003, the year of VR. Right? I'm still waiting for that. So the point is, this, this stuff is unstrategic. It's kind of, it's, except what, it's what I'll talk about later on, it's experiential. It's like, yeah, let's do that. That sounds awesome. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not the right goal. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Okay, that's enough. Um, so I really need to turn this right off, actually. Um, so basically, look. I'm going to give this to you now. You don't have to, um, don't, listen to, don't listen to me. But the key word, the real critical thing to focus on about everything to do with innovation, really, is this word, internet. It's not phone. It's not the word digital. It's not Snapchat filter. It's not like blockchain. It's internet. That's the thing that's changed everything, right? And when you realize that the internet is just a shortened or abbreviated word expression for a uh, net or a set of networks that are interconnected. That's it. And if we started, if we had the time, and I wish we did, and maybe we can do it later, uh, you know, I would say to you, what are you passionate about? And, and then you might say, what would you say? This is tough on this. Uh, well, <laughs> no, because I'm going to say books. And then books. Look at me. That's fine. Well, you're in good company. <laughs> okay, but, okay, so that's a, that's, a, that's a Russian doll, right? Inside that, which specific books? Good ones, okay, that's good. Is there a particular tr like tribe within the tribe that you're part of? At the moment, I'm really loving a vocational memoir. Oh, I like a little yeah. vocational memoir myself. <laughs> What's your name? Flick. Flick, pleasure to meet you. So look, genuinely, and I'm not even kidding, I do actually like that kind of stuff. So me and you just have found something to talk about, right, to connect over. And what's amazing about the internet is that there's probably a couple of us that would want to talk about that at a party in the kitchen where all the real chat happens, right? Um, but if someone said food, we'd have a show of hands. If someone said sport, I wouldn't be part of that, as you can probably tell. But like, some people would say this. You know, and then, you can get, and then you, what you realise is the long tail of this is really long. Because I really love hardcore techno from Berlin. Right? And, so, and, so like, and I'll make distinctions that most people in, in, would be like, what are you talking about? And I'll be like, no, that's Detroit techno versus... No. And so if someone says to me, do you like Calvin Harris? I'm like, no, that's not the same thing. Right? So once you start to see culture and you realise that culture is made up of these networks that are interconnected, the kind of internet starts to make a bit of sense. And then you start thinking, OK, so we can start recruiting from all these groups. And when you really look at your business model in Penguin, what you're really doing is looking at these tribes, these cultural networks, and basically activating them with content. Right? Because it's like he's really into this Dave Asprey thing about bulletproof copy. It makes no sense to me. Right? But there's a tribe of people around that. There's a tribe of people around... Uh, CrossFit, right? and they're cult-like, these things, you know? Like, they have codes, and when you understand those codes, you have all the authority in the world to go in there and add value, right? Now, this one's a culture, you know, a cluster of networks. This is a social network. In 2010, I got this from Sean Parker, who was my investor at the time. Stupid idea, he gave me 40 million. <laughs> um, um, but this is a social network, this is Facebook being activated, and these are tribes, not paid media, these are tribes lighting up. So we, at that time our client was Barack Obama and we were basically trying to get him re-elected and what we had was 39 different groups and we eventually ended up getting more like 50 and it'd be like pet lovers for Obama where we'd post a picture of Bo the dog on the White House lawn and they'd go fucking crazy, <laughs> right? And then, so what you start to do is you start to approach this not from demographics as in like, hi, you were, I'm imagining 21 year old female living in London. Tell me, yeah. <laughs> Tell me I've gone the right way. Um, you know, so instead of saying, you know, imagine if, I, you know, hello, what's your name? Uh, Dimit. Pleasure to meet you, man. Pleasure to meet you. So imagine if I was like, Dimit's here. No one ever went, oh my God, I am also male. Right? But if you go, I like vocational uh, biographies, that's interesting, right? And if you start realizing that you're into the same things, there's reason to connect, right? So look, this is a very long tale, right? I've just, as you can probably tell, I need to meditate, so I've been learning about this. These are the honest guys, and anyone who calls themselves the honest guys are not honest. It's like the, like the Democratic Republic of, definitely not democratic. Um, so three hours relaxing water sound music. How many views has this had? It, they don't have a big 
agency or paid media or any of that stuff. Two dudes, man. Not exactly great artwork. I'm like a piece of clip art. Tomorrowland, this is my world, electronic music. 103 million views. This is the source of the sun, right? And if you can find a way to move into these systems and approach them with authority and credibility and lead them, you end up winning, right? So, and this is because people associate with their personality, their values, their hobbies, but not with their gender or their sexual identity. That doesn't matter. So stop targeting people by that. Start targeting them by what they're actually passionate about, right? So, and this gives you infinite opportunities for growth. Now, as I said to you, I've told this to many, many companies over the, over, and it's the same thing. Nothing's changed. Like, I'm not saying something new. Basically, a broken record. I hate myself. I hate the sound of my own voice. But they all say the same thing. We're going to make some changes around here. Thank you so much for coming in. And then I come back, or I see them on Facebook a couple of days later, and it's like, Burger King, can you find the hidden chicken nugget? Like when you find it. After we've just talked about tribes and how you can activate cultural networks and everything like, hmm, let's cover a chicken. It's like, it's like that feel, it's like saw, like wanna play a game. <laughs> cover a chicken nugget in chips and then like when you, right? Campari, if you could sum up the last 150 years of Campari in three words, what would they be? And someone said, crap social media. <laughs> right? Skoda, now if someone at Burger King smoking a bit of this, and I haven't done this by the way for weeks, um, then someone at Skoda is genuinely on strong hallucinogenic drugs, okay? So to you, which side of a Skoda is more important, front or back? <laughs> this is, by the way, after we've done like a week-long hack on how to completely change the mindset and do exactly what you need to do in order to win. People just revert, it's like thermosetting and thermoforming plastics. They just go back to the original shape they were in. And then this guy, Gus Ferguson, that awkward moment you realize the whole of the internet is laughing at you. His comments had 4,399 likes. And basically somewhere in the boardroom, they're like, oh, engagement's really going up on the page, right? <laughs> it's insane, right? So look, nine out of 10 of the Fortune 500 have shrunk, merged, or gone bankrupt. So actually, this is terrifying, right? Like, and honestly, to be honest, it's getting worse because this thing here, this technology curve, is getting steeper and faster and faster and faster and faster. So if your human adaptability or organizational adaptability is really linear, and technology is really, really exponential, you're fucked, okay? And so this is what I mean when I say, actually innovation happens to you most of the time. It's not something that I don't sit and go, what innovative things should we do today, team? I'm like, what shit storm do we need to deal with now? You know, it's coming at you. So I don't want you to be inspired by innovation. I want you to have a healthy fear of it because it's what's gonna take a lot from you. And I mean this, there's something very Arthur Miller about this, there's something very death of a salesman about this, which is that, you know, my dad can't even turn a computer on, right? Now, thank God he j lived just early enough that he's old enough now to not have to worry about that, right? But he can't adapt, he can't evolve, and he can't update his operating system fast enough, because, and, and if he had been maybe 20 years younger, he would be, have a real serious problem. He would be almost unemployable. Now. This is what's interesting. I think we talk about innovation at society level, industry level, category level, company level, line of business level, business unit level, team level. And sometimes we talk about it at the level of you. I actually think it goes even deeper than that. When I say intimate, I mean really intimate. And this is about to get quite heady, okay? Because innovation is not technological, it's psychological. That is the most important thing that I've learned for the years that I've been doing this, working with individuals and massive organizations like transform, digitally transforming the whole of L'Oreal with 170,000 employees all the way down to sitting with Hugh Jackman and saying, okay, buddy, this is how you do a Facebook post, right? This is what you learn. And what you learn is it's all in here. And it's actually even more deeper than that. So how do we identify the right goals? Well, you, you have to lock in, right? You have to identify the experiential interests, which are the things that are not the right goals, right? That's the do a Snapchat, do a this, do a that, right? That's what, by the way, and I mean this really seriously, there's a tragedy in this, genuinely, because there's nothing more exhausting than seeing someone who's been working till 11 at night, haven't been seeing their family, and the thing that they're working on, they show it to you and you know it's gonna fail. I, I really seriously mean that, and I have, that has happened to me countless times, where you're like, 
Oh my God. And that's why people give up on innovation because they're like the rat that keeps pressing the thing and getting electrocuted. They just sit there, learned helplessness and go, well, I'm not going to do anything then. So if it suffers from diminishing marginal returns, like I really love drum and bass, for example, right? I know that it's not that great, but you can't judge me for it. So experiential interests, they suffer from diminishing marginal returns, i.e. they kind of quite quickly fade. You can't really judge people for them one way or the other. So it's like, I'm into this, great, you're into that, whatever. It doesn't really matter if they're real. Like, it's like, it could be something that's, you know, you could be like, oh, I'm in the body of Brad Pitt, in bed with Angelina Jolie, or whoever he's with now, right? And it doesn't matter if it's actually you. It doesn't really matter if it's hacking you, because you're like, yeah, I know that it's hacking me, I don't care. And it doesn't have to be memorable. Whereas there there's another type of interest, and this is a personal thing, this is not about business necessarily, but it works at business level, which is critical things. And they're the things that like, could this be a chapter in my life, like when you had your kid? Right? It's not like you went like, yes, I'm a kid! You were like, this is a serious consideration. This is a critical decision that I'm making. Can this thing outlive you? When people sign living wills to say that, look, if I'm incapacitated, I'd like to have my life support turned off. It's not a small decision, right? It's highly strategic. Is it in line with your highest values? Does it generate meaning for you? And does it make anyone that you know or people that matter to you and yourself proud? These are the things that we should have goals around, right? Not what we just read in Fast Company or, or, or what, what we just saw in the, the most recent thing. Let all that digital hurricane bypass you. It's complete noise. Focus all the time on what you know, what you know is going to add genuine value to your life and to your business. And look, this is our only chance. If we can update the human ad adaptability, we have a chance, right? I'm just going to give you a very quick anecdote about how this relates personally and then we're going to business. This is my nana. She sadly passed away because a bit after this we found out that she had cancer and then she died quite quickly. Um, this is our family and you know, we were very, very lucky. You know? And I remember the time when I found out that Nana wasn't very well. My mum said, look, because you know, my mum assumed that because I'm a DJ, I was the kind of DJ that plays at a wedding, but I can tell you I was not that type of DJ. I was not a balloon animals DJ, oh no. Um, so I basically, um, she said, would you download some music for Nana? Because she's sitting in a hospital bed and she's got nothing. Like, just play, you know, download some of the tunes you know. You know, you know the ones, the boys own and all that stuff that she loves. And I said, absolutely, of course I will. But Martin and I were living together at the time, so we were living like this, right? We were students, and there's a certain time in a man's life or boy's life where it's absolutely compulsory to go and collect a cone and bring it home. And that's what you spend, <laughs> you're like this. <laughs> oh yes, I remember that time. And it's an interesting time. And we lived like, it was like, literally like we lived like, it was like, the Lion King. It was like, everything that the light touches is ours, but you must never go downstairs because there's loads of rats, <laughs> right? It was disgusting. We lived in hell, basically, and we were procrastinators of the highest order. We didn't do any work. We were stoners. We, we would tell, I like to think we were intelligent, but we never showed anyone it. This is our place. This is the level I'm talking about here, right? But what was interesting, and I say this you know, as a provocation, was that uh, we read a lot of books read a lot of books, and not just random books, not just vocational autobiographies, like, we read all the success literature titles. Like, I'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone about success literature, any, anything, right? Because we read every single one of them. But did we do anything? No. And this is what I mean, again, about the difference between, uh, we, we need knowledge, and I'm definitely not saying we don't need knowledge, but we need implementation of knowledge as well. Otherwise, it's just another thing that goes in and goes through. Um, I was personally very affected by like night terrors. I don't know if you know what those are, but it's like panic attacks on steroids. Like you literally wake up in the middle of the night going like, oh, and you can't move. So I was genuinely really affected by this. And it got to the point where one night before the big exam, the EU exam, I did what every you know, male you know, person would do, which is like think to myself, I haven't done any revision, I haven't done any work, how do I get out of this? So I genuinely considered, you know, what if I hired a car and crashed it? How, and phoned up my friend who worked, who was in medicine, saying like, how can I get food poisoning fast? And this is how ridiculous it was. Um, and in the end, and this is unpalatable, I got him, because he's the only person that would love me enough to do this, to come round and punch me in the face. Hard enough that I'd have a bruise, and I'd be able to say, sorry, I got beaten up last night, and I can't do the exam. Now, isn't it insane that I would exhibit unbelievable willpower to stand there and be punched in the face, but none of the willpower to do the necessary work to take the exam. Right? It just doesn't make any sense. But this is actually, when we're honest with ourselves, the way we operate. We're willing to do all these things to get out of things, but none of the pain to get into them. 
So how do we not just lock out problems, but lock in success? So um, anyway, long story short, not long after that, about five days after that, Nana passed away and we hadn't made the tape. Right? And I remember mum saying, would have been really nice for you to make that tape. And I, li I literally, we, I, I swear to God, we just, we just, we split in two, basically. We were like, there's a, there's a different level of sorrow when you have something happens, but there's also that regret attached to it. And there's this Yetzer demon in Judaism which says it's the demon that eats your soul. And I honestly contend that the things that we say we're going to do, that we don't do, cause most of the misery in the world. Most of the misery in the world is self-hatred projected out. And I really believe that. The more I think about it, the more I see people failing in their everyday attempts. And by the way, this is not to come back at you guys because of your resolutions, right? But once you start promising yourself big things, like, you know, once you start saying, I'm going to be faithful and you're not, once you start saying, I'm going to look after someone and you don't, it's hard to have a high self-image of yourself, right? So we ended up on the dark web, as we probably were spending a lot of our time, and we found this system which basically said the reason that you're failing in your goals is because you're structured and the way you think about yourself is wrong. You've been given this kind of idea of like economic theory, which is like you're this one person over time, but there's this motif that runs through all art, all literature, all, and very, it, through science now, which basically says you're best modeled as two people over time. This is Goethe saying two souls are last dwelling in the breast. One is striving to forsake its brother. This is the interesting thing. This is in films, even though they're shit films. Um, you know, the, you guys have published a few books about this stuff over the years, right? We have like Jung's theory about the divided self, you know, yeah, Freud's theory about the divided self, Kahneman. And look, from a, from, a, from a hardcore biological point of view, it does make sense because there are different systems in the brain. So what you end up with is something that looks a little bit more like this. Experiential system, critical system. And this comes back to innovation again. This is where I see people going wrong all the time in innovation. They're like, we're going to innovate around a load of stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, it's going to fail. You've set yourself the wrong goal. So how do we do this? Well, we've got to recognize, first of all, that over time, we are sometimes experiential and sometimes critical, right? This is individually and as organizations. Sometimes we're like, we just got to hit Q3 forecast, right? And then sometimes we're like, no, we're going to take a step back and we're going to go, is this really the right way we should be heading as a business? Same as we do as people. And the thing about critical and experiential interests, they're not really friends. They're actually kind of locked in this, what we would call distributive issue of justice. It means that they're both pulling to get, to, to get the, the, the kind of sovereignty, let's say. And what you end up with is, you know, bring it back to yourself. When you've run out of money, who did it? No one else did it. Your experiential self did it. Right? You, were too, you were click happy on Amazon, right? So you end up with this situation where we have like the reptilian brain saying, go on, have a few more drinks. And then the next morning being like, oh my God, what the hell happened? And we've all been there, right? And some people are like, Ugh. Um, And look, and this is kind of fun sometimes, but if you're George Best and you literally drink yourself to death because you can't get control and ever get into the critical system and you're living constantly experientially, it's not fun anymore. So there's actually, again, the same tragedy that I see in businesses is the same tragedy I see in people. And because I've had this very unique experience of working with individual famous people, like, you know, go and meet Charlize Theron and explain how this works, and then come back six months later and say, Debbie, did you do it? And they go, yeah, no. But it was really inspirational. And then you go and work with L'Oreal on a massive scale, or Unilever on a massive scale, and they do the same. You realize, hang on, innovation's happening just individually, person to person. And so, you know, this was him looking back at himself saying, you know, don't die like I did. So look, we've talked about wrong goals. Let's finish with wrong method, right? It's really hard to set a resolution, sometimes that's not even a very good resolution because the goal itself is wrong, and then actually find a way to lock in. It's, it's basically impossible. And the reason for that is that, look, in life, we do things because we're contractually obliged to do them. Like, you don't come to, you don't come to work because you just love it, and I know you guys love it, right? Of course, of course. <laughs> Especially Hannah, she really loves it. Um, but truly, you are contractually obliged to be here. Right? And there are consequences if you don't come. Right? And what's weird is we all accept this. Like Each individual has between tens and hundreds of different contracts. You have a contract with your mobile phone provider. You have a contract with your mortgage broker. Not broker, your, your, whoever provided your mortgage. You have a contract with so many people, but you don't think about it because binding yourself in this way is a paradox that you accept in some way makes you more free. Right? 
So you get that. You're like, yeah. But when it comes to contracting with yourself, and by the way, look, there are consequences like this. Like Faust, you can make a Faustian bargain that's really bad. You can do what Eduardo Saverin did in this social network uh, movie and sign your shares away and make bad decisions. But we allow contracts to happen because that's how the world's structured. We just go, yeah, sometimes you're going to fuck up and make a bad decision on a contract. But contracts generally are a good idea, even though they're quite radical. Like, there's something very radical about being like, yeah, you've got to do this, otherwise you have serious consequences will happen. It's like, oh, why would I bind myself, rest restrict my options, give myself less leeway to, to, to exist? There's got to be, a, there's a paradox there. It's like, it's got to make you more free in some other way. So look, when we were on this dark web forum, I remember clicking at a particular moment, it was after George Best died, and someone was saying, like, why can't you contract with yourself? Just a simple question. And this thread went on and on and on and on. Yeah, why can't you contract with yourself? And what you realise was that one person cannot create a binding contract. It's not enforced by the state, so the state will not enforce it. Like, the state will never be like, yeah, you want to stop smoking? We'll support you. Can't happen, right? It's, it's, it doesn't, it's not even in our... It's like sci-fi. It's like something out of Black Mirror. It doesn't, doesn't exist, right? So, no, so nothing happens. But we try and do this every day. Like, we literally try and contract with ourselves every day. We just don't have the legal opportunity to do so. So we're constantly saying, look at this guy. This guy's trying to give up smoking. This is real, right? These are some of the people that we met on this forum, by the way, right? This is like, I've got a great idea, guys, if you're trying to give up smoking. Build a cage and put it over your head like you're a hamster. Okay. But what's really interesting is people almost feel like they've got this need that's not being met. It's almost like this, this, they want to be able to bind themselves, but they can't. This guy paid, I mean, this is the ridiculousness. This guy paid this lady to slap him every time he didn't achieve a certain thing within a certain time. So he'd be like, you've got half an hour, get that bit done. Slap, ah! But this, this idea, obviously it's ridiculous, right? But it kind of, there's something there, right? So, and look, what we tend to find, if I was to summarise all these contracts and these ways that people are trying to bind themselves, I would say that it could come down to six different things. Number one. You bind yourself in legally available ways. I always take the mickey out of Martin saying that Martin was a complete idiot until he met Erica, his wife, and then he realised, oh my God, that's the critical me. She's going to help me bind. And then she was like, he was like, get married to me now. Basically because that was the best way he could lock himself in to be a better version of himself. Right? Second one is change the payoff matrix. Change things that can be changed that disincentivize certain behaviour and incentivize other behaviour. Right? Third one is control the environment. This is a classic one of Cortez arrived on the beaches of uh, South America and burnt the ships. Because he's like, we're not going back. And all of this applies in innovation because in innovation, we all start with good intentions. I'm telling you, I never, I never went to a seminar or workshop or didn't, when everyone didn't look at each other and go, this time will be different, we're going to do it. And they fucking don't every time. And maybe it's me, actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So the other one is limit the options. So in this example, the, the rat had the option to keep hitting the thing and it would, get, it would get pellets. But actually what's interesting is the rat knows it'll eat itself, it'll literally eat and eat and eat until it dies. And at a certain point, it realizes that it presses another button, it stops, and it wants to press that button. That's why people go and get their mouths sewn up and people go and get gastric bands. Like this is interesting and kind of, kind of a bit weird and a bit dark stuff, but it's, it's something that we need to think about if we're gonna actually do innovation. Next one is financial bidding. Like, put, you know, we were literally, I, mean, I think Martin at one point, you were probably the number one contributor to the Westboro Baptist Church in the world. So we would say, put money in escrow. If you don't complete this by this date, the money goes, not just in the beginning, it'd be like, you know, give the money to Care International. That didn't hurt enough. Then it'd be like, give the money to the whatever party that you don't like in the, uh, in, in the political spectrum. Then it'd be like, give money to the Westboro Baptist Church. That hurts. That's adding insult to injury when you're literally giving money to someone you despise. And then, of course, little things like this. We'd be like, we'd be like you've got to do this. But all of this stuff, I mean, it's obviously stupid, but it's an attempt to try and find a way to lock in so that we don't just make resolutions that we can't actually stand up to. And the final one, which was my per absolute personal favourite, was public humiliation. This one was the, by far the most used within these groups that we were part of, this kind of subculture. And it was hilarious, where people would like... And there was a kind of funny side and a serious side. The funny side was people would like send in their diary and people could publish this diary. So it'd be like, dear diary, well, I finally happened. I'm actually going on a date. And people would just rip them, right? And, but on the more serious note, people would send in letters saying to their employer, uh, yeah, I've been doing cocaine in the toilets for the past X money years. 
and the, the letter goes if non-completion of a certain idea, right? Now, all this is extreme, right? All this is extreme. But there's a principle here. So, you know, we used to get trains to Glasgow and back, not to actually go to Glasgow. We'd get off, get a Burger King, come back, because back in the day you couldn't get internet on a train. You still can't. And um, we'd go up and back purely so that we could control the environment and not be in a situation where we were distractible. We would tell, <laughs> we would tell Benji, our uh, guy that was our local news agent guy, we'd, at the beginning of the week, we'd pay him not to serve us later in the week. So we'd be like, when we come in inevitably on Friday night, you are not allowed to serve us. I mean, this is the kind of face where, what? We'd take antiboost if we thought we needed to. So that's when you, you literally have a chemical reaction with alcohol. We coded, because of course we were really good at digital, little apps that would not allow you to go on certain websites. And by the way, you can get these apps now, like Freedom and these other things. Literally, you can download apps that won't let you go on certain websites. Right? We took the shower head off of our shower in our disgusting hellhole of a house so that we'd have to go to the gym and shower in the morning or maybe every three days. Right? We'd cut up our credit cards. We'd, put, we'd lock away our things so that our computers would die right in the middle of 24, it would usually be back then. It'd be like, you'd be watching 24, and they'd go, doo, doo, and then your computer would die. would be like, damn, because you'd left it deliberately so that you'd have to go to sleep. So look, actually, this worked. This is the most insane bit. So my brilliant dream of becoming a DJ, I did it. Oh, I, you know, I'm not going to say it was, I was very good, but I did it because we were actually moving forward. Things were changing. We went from complete idiots to actually trying to, you know, get somewhere. And so we started saying, we need to write this down as a system. And I locked Martin in a room in a particular moment, and he literally, like, I mean, it was horrendous. Like, I remember about 72 hours in, it was like, he had to write this essay or write this dissertation on this idea, get it all down. And you were going to try and submit it to Harvard and see if you could get a scholarship there, which is ridiculous because no one in our family has even been to university apart from us. Like, people in our family do not go to Harvard, right? And we don't have the money to go, right? So Martin's like screaming on the other side of the door, like, I've had enough, let me out. It was like an exorcism, right? Because when the experiential self takes control again, you're like, uh-oh, it's that thing again. I'm like, uh-oh, he's going back to experience. So it was literally like something out of train spotting, but wrote it, submitted it to Harvard, and it was about, Unilateral contract formation. Can you contract with yourself? Why doesn't the law allow it? What are the examples? You Harvard were like, this is phenomenal. Full scholarship. Then at that point, we really took it seriously. So this has been quite silly at this point. But then we really started to go, OK, look, you know, we started developing this as a, as a, as a body of work, right? So we gave it, I gave a TED talk about it. It's had like 1.3 million views now in the past couple of months. I've literally had endless, endless, endless requests on LinkedIn. Can you tell me more about this lock-in thing? Can you, can, I'm constantly overstressed and having panic attacks. I'm watching your video, made me feel like I'm not alone. Self-sabotaging bastard, please help. Right? So this has just been growing. And actually, there's a fairly large community of people in this now. It's like a tribe, right? Um, and we've been working with CEOs. So instead of just going in and doing the workshop now, I'm like, I will not give you that week-long uh, off-site unless there are certain conditions met at the end and you will commit to these things. And people are like, well, do we have to? I'm like, yes. Because otherwise, it's just a waste of my time. And honestly, more than anything, it's a waste of yours. So don't, don't exhaust yourself with the inspiration and then the heartache of not doing it. So just quickly, we're going to finish with this. What does is, what is, what is it work? How does it work? You need a goal, remember? And you need a method for enforcing it. Remember in Fight Club where he goes into the, uh, he goes into the news agency, grabs the, the guy out and he pulls him on the floor and he puts a gun on his head. He says, what do you always want to be? And he goes, a vet, a vet, a vet. And he says, I'm going to come back in six weeks and if you're not on your way to being a vet, I'm going to kill you. Right? Now, obviously, this is extreme. I'm dramatizing it. Right? I'm trying to make it sexy and fun and cool. Truth be told, it's just committing right? when we find it hard to commit. So seven principles to, for you guys to walk away with. Look, when you get your head around this, you might want to try this with each other. Locking in our critical self actually makes us more free, like we said before. And by the way, this is kind of do you think this is a bit Fifty Shades? Maybe it is. You know, no, but I'm trying to make contracts more sexy than they are. But you know, this is what we do. Contracts, you know, an organization like Penguin probably has, I mean, how many contracts? I can't even imagine, like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of contracts. Imagine just making one where you committed to something that was critical to the success of the business or the success of the staff, whatever, right? In a way that's, you know, like this. Second one, we accept this paradox as true because these are the important things in life. We don't necessarily always want to have these things happen to us, but they do, and they're good for us. So accepting more responsibility and accepting more obligation 
is a really good idea. And by the way, this is what Jordan Peterson is talking about all the time, which, whether you like him or not, is why he's blowing up so hard, especially amongst young men, because we've had such a rights culture for so long. And I was a human rights lawyer, so I say this with love. We've had such a rights culture for so long that it's an ad infinitum, and people don't ever talk about responsibilities and obligations. And what they really want is actually that, because that's what gives life meaning, right? Because they don't have to just float around the world anymore going like, I don't know anything and I'm very upset. And so many forces are attempting to hack. And then, you know, if you saw Blade Runner 2049, this is a really heartbreaking relationship between these two where he is essentially being hacked by love that isn't real. And let me tell you something for a fact. Let me tell you honestly, in the future, and I'm, they're already starting this right now, Amazon, etc., etc., they will figure you out and they will hack you before you hack yourself. Unless we start hacking ourselves, the biggest, smartest companies in the world with all of our data and all of the AI to crunch it will hack us. So this is a real thing. Like, it's going to really define a lot of the next decade. So the critical system needs to lock in to defend itself, otherwise we know where it goes. And helping each other lock in may, does go against many instincts. And I'm not saying you have to punch someone in the face or anything, but saying to someone, look, you promised you would be here and you're not, and there's going to be consequences for that. And it doesn't have to be serious, but it can be like, Whatever it is that you can think of that works for you, right? And it'll go against the instincts because you're going to be like, oh, I really like you now. I met you and you're my friend. But don't do it. Actual love, tough love is what you need. And that's why with the CEOs that we're working with, we're not saying, oh, you know what? Don't worry. It's fine. You know, don't worry. We're not, no, you did not complete on the contract. And that's going to cost. So once you lock in, so of course, we seek to protect each other as much as possible, so we're not trying to hurt each other or get each other into a state where you know, you're bound in a way that you don't want to be bound. But, and this is a film, by the way, about a skunk that bites a man and he ties himself to the thing and then realises he hasn't got rabies and is like, oh dear, I'm going to die. Right? So once you, if there was a, it's like in contract. If there's a material breach of the contract or there's something wrong in the terms, you can release yourself. But that's the only example that you can. If not, it's irreversible. And that's a dangerous idea. That's quite a dangerous and maybe a very, very bad idea. But I can tell you now, it works. It actually works. And what I would say to you guys is, this is an ancient idea. This is Ulysses binding himself to the mask because he knew the sirens were coming. Seeing in advance that you're going to definitely not want to get up tomorrow morning and go for that run, or more importantly, that you're definitely not going to want to actually do that innovation thing that you said you would do it the last year. And actually going, how do we stop ourselves from slipping back into that, that foremost, thermoforming plastic that we were before? Because I see in companies constantly trying. And then what happens is someone else comes along, a tech startup that doesn't have any of those legacy issues, and wipes them off the face of the earth. And it's sad. I see it so many times. And this is starting to become a thing now. People are actually starting to, this is actual idea building. I'm telling you, there's, a, there's steam behind this idea now. In Australia now, you can phone up and exclude yourself from bookmakers. That's an interesting idea. The history of modern philosophy doesn't have ideas like this. Like, when you can call up and say, I don't want ever to be allowed to make a bet, ever. Ban all these credit cards. That's interesting. And that's at the level of governance and, and governments. And, and this is where it's all going to kick off, and we're working on an interesting project in this, smart contracts. Smart contracts on the blockchain do not require you to contract with someone else. If, I, if you have a contract with the Internet of Things where you put your key in someone's uh, door, turn the key and the money that you just paid them to buy that house deb debits their account, there is no need for someone else or an, a third party to oversee that. It's completely done. And so now there's no reason why you have to contract with someone else or get someone else to help you lock in. You can just do it yourself. You didn't make the gym this morning? £10 deposit to the Westboro Baptist Church. I hope the Westboro Baptist Church makes no money. Um, so why now? Look, just to finish this, we really have no choice. If technology is going to go like this, and we're going to continue like this, individually, as companies, as a society, we're fucked. Like, really. I'm not even joking. And I've seen this at every single level. This speaks for itself. This is coming. Like, this is not a joke. And I don't mean like it's coming in 35 years. I know that we all thought that, like, in a... Like in the original Blade Runner was based in 2019. We can't even get on a conference call in 2019. Right? Everyone's like, there was going to be flying cars and you know, all these like replicants and stuff like that. It's like, no, I still can't get on this conference call. Right? Um, and you know, when, the, when, the, when the head of the World Bank, uh, the, the Bank of England is saying, AI uh, threatens uh, 
lengthy and widespread unemployment. This is tough. We have to be able to evolve faster. Otherwise, we're going to see this. We're going to see death of a salesman times a million, where people who literally are good people, truly good people, are left behind by a system that just doesn't have time for them anymore because it's too rapid. And this is tragic, right? So look, I'm just going to finish with this. Left alone on your own, you, 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 each one of us individually are pretty vulnerable. Right? We are very easy to hack. And we're going to be hacked. We'd all be, we're already getting hacked. Like, I'm not even kidding. There's a whole book about that. Right? But it's real. And I haven't got time to talk about it now. But like, really, we've done our research on this. It's insane. From, you're being hacked from, in ways you could never imagine. Like ambient warfare. Like literally, I'm talking like sounds being emitted that only certain people of certain ages can hear so that they won't want to stand around a certain area. Like seriously. And when you, you know, my good friend Spike Jones made her, which you have a chance to see. Some people hate it. I really love it. I think it's a beautiful film. You realize that it's an AI like Siri that's just hacking him and talking to millions of other people as well. And it's a beautiful film, I think. But it's this idea that on your own, you're lonely, you're vulnerable. You're easy to control. And I honestly think, this is what Nietzsche said, he who cannot obey himself will be commanded. That is the nature of all living creatures. And honestly, I think that is where it goes. Like the experience, experiential system will probably, will probably win. And that's, that's bad for us. We need to keep up. And I honestly think this is what all this is about. When you see people trying to go back to a past that was easier, it's even more tragic because you're like, I promise you, it's just going to get faster. Like, it ain't slowing down for you or for anyone else. And you can't go back to the 80s and pretend that it's, it's, there was no make something great again. It's just, let's go. And so look, the only bit of hope that I have, and I'll just leave you with this. And I know this is quite abstract, but I wanted this to be abstract because I get, get that you're a smart people. Is look, I could have talked to you about innovation all day long. Right? I could have talked to you about what you're supposed to do. But my bet is you would have been inspired for about an hour had lunch or dinner or whatever and forgotten about it by tomorrow morning, right? So what instead I wanted to leave you with is something that which hopefully you can use amongst yourselves. And what I want you to do is think about this. This human adaptability thing assumes individuals. It doesn't assume what happens when we collect together. Like me on my own or Martin on his own or any of the people on that group that I told you about on the, on the subculture thing, individually, we're as hackable and as, as, as weak as everyone else. But when we came together, shit happened. Like really interesting stuff. And that's what happens. When you come together, if you guys start to find ways to enforce each other's goals or have the same goals, or as a company you start setting yourself around serious, critical, well thought through ideas that are not just knee-jerk innovations, but real. Right? And trust me, I can help you with all that stuff. Right? That's what we do. But it won't mean nothing unless you can lock it in. But when you do that, you release that exponential energy. Things, really exciting things start to happen. And then, this is, this is the whole history of, of, of history. The whole history of history is massive evolutions forward that happen very quick. And this is how we keep up. I'm, I, look, call me old fashioned, I quite like the idea of human rights. I think that was a good thing, right? Like when after the war, we came together to form the, the, the idea that human beings have inviolable rights. Like, that's a step forward, massive step forward. And not one individual could do that. Like, people together did that because they bound each other. And actually, interestingly, this is a binding document. When you look at constitutions, they're just things that say, no, you can't do that even though you want to. So if you're Jack Bauer and you want to torture a terrorist suspect under the ECHR, it's like, sorry, Article 3, non-derogation of torture. You cannot torture someone under any circumstances. Cannot do it. That's interesting. That's a whole society binding itself. And we accept all these ideas, but we can't apply it to our businesses and to ourselves. So look, just to finish off, takeaways. Genuinely, I want you to think about who's in this room. Think about who you know at work. I think about who you know in your life. I think, who could I recruit into my little cult? I told you this is the cult of extreme innovation, right? Who could I recruit to get into this idea? Who could I share these principles with? It's a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, but like, you know, we call it like Procrastinators Anonymous, right? Like, who can you, like Martin and I did with some of our friends, well, a lot of our, I mean, how many, like, a lot of our friends now do this. Like, it's a, it's a thing that we talk about. Who can you get into this system? How can you identify the critical, and not just the knee-jerk experiential things that will actually make a difference and not just be like, oh, yeah. And how can you get people to hold you to account and actually let them lock you in? So, look, 
I know that isn't the inspirational innovation talk that you wanted, but I honestly hope that it will have more impact than insp inspiration. And finally, I just want to say, if anyone, once you start doing this, because I know you will, comes up to you and says, what you're doing these days is so inspirational, remember to tell them to fuck right off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Cheers, guys.